Hey team, Dr. Jack Audie, and in this video I'm going to be talking about virulence factors. Now virulence factors is a factor, it's often a protein, that helps a bacteria become a disease, it becomes a pathogen. So we're going to be looking at what makes an opportunistic pathogen, something normally not necessarily um, damaging for us, switch into a pathogenic mode. And one of the key answers to this is virulence factors. So let's jump into it. So, what evidence do we have that virulence factors is one of the key distinguishing features between um, a bacteria like E. coli, how it might be healthy in your gut, or it might be causing a disease. So, normally you would want E. coli in your intestines, um, but some E. coli can cause um, horrible diseases uh, and diarrhea. What's the difference between an E. coli that's fine and an E. coli that's causing a disease? Well, some of the answers is genetics, and those genetics are coding for proteins, and those proteins are virulence factors. Now, we know this by what we can do is look at the genetic relationship between different strains of E. coli. So this is um, a, a cladogram, and basically, the closer these along the outside are all different strains, all different versions of um, E. coli. And how close they are on the circle, so these are more closely related than those, because these are on the other side of the circle. You've got to go all the way around here to get to them. So how close they are on this sort of semicircle is how closely they are related genetically, right? How similar are they genetically? And they've actually been color-coded. So in orange, we have strains that typically cause intestinal disease. So the, I mean, not intestinal disease like urinary tract infections, a non-intestinal pathogen in orange. In blue we have an intestinal pathogen like diarrhea, and so these are E. coli that are often associated with causing diarrhea. In purple we have both, they can be associated with um, an intestinal disease or a skin disease or a urinary tract infection. And in grey, we have strains that are more commonly associated with benefiting the patient, producing vitamin K, not causing disease, the mutualistic or commensal bacteria. In the dark grey, we have environmental bacteria, so these are normally found in the environment, not found in the humans. And in yellow, we have unknown. Now, what I hope you can see is that there's groups of highly genetically related strains of E. coli that do not cause disease. So this is a big chunk of genetically related E. coli right here that are all in the gray or the light gray or the dark gray, meaning that they don't typically cause disease. And over here, we've got a big chunk that is blue and orange, and these are pathogens. And these are more closely genetically related, and these are more co closely genetically related than they are between each other. So this strongly points to a genetic origin for them to be a virulent pathogenic uh, form of E. coli compared to a safe, healthy form of E. coli. So what are some of these genetic factors that leads to a normally safe or uh, opportunistic pathogen from switching from being uh, not a problem to a big problem, a big disease? So here we've got um, a, a beautiful diagram. It's incredibly complex, but this is actually Pseudomonas. So Pseudomonas is often normally in the environment, and it can turn into a pathogen if it gets onto you and into you at high doses. And it has a number of these things that we call virulence factors, which are proteins that aid it in its uh, ability to cause disease, to infect us and to cause disease. And we're going to jump into how some of these work in order to evade the immune system and to damage us and feast on the cells after they um, lies our cells, for example. Now, first, I'm going to blotch out some of it because it's all a little bit too complicated. I don't have enough time to go into this entire um, pathway. So I'm going to just look at these. So let's jump into it bit by bit. So first in this diagram, all on the right-hand side is really our inflammatory factors. Um, and these aren't so much virulence factors. They don't help the bacteria um, in terms of proliferation and invasiveness. But what they do do is they help the bacteria cause disease. Because if we end up with too much inflammation, inflammation can be very damaging. And so if we have lots of these factors that activate the immune system and cause inflammatory responses, that can be a problem, particularly if it's in our lungs. Our lungs can fill with fluid, for example. So it has a flagellum that helps it moves around, although Pseudomonas isn't famous for being an active swimmer. But flagellum can activate 
um, pattern recognition receptors on our immune cells like TLR5, and that can cause the production of inflammatory cytokines. It also has LPS, this is probably the most famous pathogen associated molecular pattern, and this binds to receptors on our immune cells called TLR4, causing the production of uh, inflammatory cytokines. Um, these factors can also activate the inflammasome, which I've covered in a previous video, which is one of the most inflammatory receptors in your body to activate, and essentially it causes the production of IL-1 beta and IL-18. Now, I could probably do this better on a number of mechanisms here. They've got flagell in there, which activates a kind of inflammasome called NLRC4, but it would also be able to activate my favorite NLRP3 with this LPS, um, as well as with some of the toxins it produces. But what do we see down here? We see this little something. Whenever you see this flat line, that's an inhibitor. So we see something here inhibiting the activation of the inflammasome. Now, what might that be? Well, that's XOS and XOU. That's exotoxin XS and exotoxin U. And that's produced by the bacteria. So let's have a look at those guys. The first question you might ask is, how did they get into the cell? Well, this is going to be one of the coolest things that ba some bacteria do. And that's bacteria actually have an amazing secretion system called the type 3 secretion system, which is like a needle and it injects us with its various um, virulence factors to help it infect us. So in this example, uh, the, here we have it, here's it pictured in a diagram, it's a little needle protruding out from the bacteria and has poked the host cell in order for it to inject those toxins into us, which is flippin' amazing. But here's um, um, some uh, electron uh, microscopy to view the protein within it. So here we can see the outer membrane, the peptide gland can in the inner membrane, so we know there's a gram-negative bacteria. And we can see this needle just sticking out here, and this is a diagram of what it. And so it can actually inject the toxins down the shaft into us. It's like it's like a little mosquito or something. It's, the bacteria sidles up next to the eukaryote cell, pokes the proteins through the membrane, and injects a toxin. Now these toxins inhibit one of our inflammatory receptors, so it stops us from mounting an immune response to this bacteria. It's a way for it to hide from our immune system. Very, very cool stuff. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to show was this was another um, diagram of this type 3 secretion system. And this here, they showed antibodies bound to the tip of it. And it's just a really nice example of neutralization. I'm just jumping back to what antibodies do. So if we produce antibodies that can bind to this um, type 3 secretion protein complex, it'll bind to the tip of it. Right here, we can see them bound to the tip of this uh, needle, and it blunts the needle. Now the needle cannot inject into our um, into our membrane. So it's a really nice example of neutralization. I thought I'd just show you that one. All right, so that's some of the virulence factors: um, exotoxin S and exotoxin U. Let's look at something else, right? So here we've got exotoxin S. It's actually doing something else. A lot of these toxins are multifactorial. So in this one, it's inhibiting a protein called RAS. Now, this diagram's from a textbook, but it got something wrong. <laughs> RAS is not an ATP-mediated molecule. It's a GTP-mediated molecule. It's a GTPase. It actually um, breaks down GTP to GDP. Now, what's that doing? Well, as soon as you see ATP going to ADP or GTP going to GDP, that is essentially both of those are just energy molecules and they use their energy to do something. And in the case of RAS, it activates a whole bunch of kinases that do a whole bunch of things in our body. But one of those things is actin polymerization. So here in this diagram, they're showing this exotoxin S is inhibiting this RAS protein. And RAS is normally involved in actin polymerization. So now the actin will uh, disassemble into monomers. Actin is the cytoskeleton of the cell. The other thing actin polymerization is super important for is phagocytosis. So immune cells need to essentially push their membrane out to wrap something and bring it in. And that's how they phagocytose. They need to push their membrane out. And it's actin that's doing the pushing. Actin polymerization, the skeleton builds out and pushes the flexible membrane out and it allows them to wrap up a bacteria and suck it in. Without actin polymerization, 
uh, without active polymerization, you cannot phagocytose the bacteria. So that's an excellent defense system. A little side note, RAS activates a whole bunch of kinases that include cell division. The cell division is important to mount an immune response. You need your macrophages, your monocytes to divide and divide and divide. Your T cells, your B cells, they all need to divide in, in, uh, when responding to an infection. And so you're blocking the division of cells by blocking RAS. Another side note is some cancers have a mutation in RAS that activates RAS. And so now RAS is causing the division of cancer cells. And we're actually researching can exotoxin S and other exotoxins from Pseudomonas be used as a chemotherapy to block these cancers from cell dividing. So it's a little twist in the tail um, using uh, the Pseudomonas exotoxins to treat cancer potentially in the future. Okay, so what else have we got? This is cool. I like talking about this because, you know, in warfare, both sides have guns and they're shooting at each other. It's the same in our immune system, right? Um, when immune systems are fighting bacteria, many of the techniques, that they're, many of the tools that they're using are very similar. So, for example, bacteria produce elastases and proteases. Um, and we produce elastases and proteases. And our elastases are designed to digest their proteins. For example, that type 3 secretion complex would get chopped up by neutrophil elastase and it couldn't work anymore. They also produce elastases to break down our extracellular matrix, and that allows the bacteria to invade. If you break down the cytos the um, extracellular matrix that's holding all our cells together, you break it down, you allow the bacteria to come in through our intestine or through our lungs, into our bloodstream, and to spread throughout our body. So it's interesting because we produce proteases, they produce proteases, um, for very similar reasons, actually. Um, also, though, this is, again, we're using the same weapons. Um, they, use, they produce a protein called pyocyanin, and cyanin is actually a very important name for it because it actually, it's blue, it's, it's cyan. Um, man, that makes me think, is it pyocyanin or pyocyanin? Anyway, cyan, I don't know the name of the color. Anyway, blue, is, light blue is sometimes called cyanin. Or, and, uh, and you actually see with a pseudomonas infection, sometimes you can see the blue inside of them because there's so much of this pyocyanin protein, which is blue, um, that's being released by the bacteria. Now, pyocyanin, um, it facilitates this reaction. Essentially, electrons jumping onto oxygen to produce one of the most damaging free radicals in existence called superoxide. Superoxide is so damaging it reacts with whatever is around it and if you react with a protein you disable that protein because you've changed its chemical structure. If you react with DNA you mutate it, you damage it, you prevent it from being used because you've changed its chemical structure. Now superoxide can't actually get that far in our body because it's so reactive but superoxide is actually broken down into um, hydrogen peroxide through a series of, uh, not broken down but it's reacted into hydrogen peroxide here um, and hydrogen peroxide is also a damaging free radical but it's slower at reacting so it can get further um, and it can travel um, outside the cell for example and start damaging other cells that um, hydrogen peroxide there's actually an enzyme in our body that converts that to that. It's called superoxide dismutase, SOD1. And if you mutate that, you can cause dementia. Um, and I covered that uh, previously. So um, it's actually our antioxidant enzyme that's doing this conversion here, converting the superoxide down into hydrogen peroxide. But it's producing these free radicals in order to kill the immune cells that are trying to come in. Um, which is so interesting because... Neutrophils are producing free radicals as well. They produce hydrogen peroxide. They then turn the hydrogen peroxide into hypochlorite, which is bleach. So neutrophils are producing free radicals to kill the bacteria, and the bacteria are producing free radicals in order to kill us. But this is just a smattering of some of the virulence factors that they have. So let me just summarize what makes an opportunistic pathogen become pathogenic. Or, um, yeah, and... An important point here is bacteria can share DNA um, and they do this by sharing um, plasmids which are small loops of DNA and they can give these to each other through um, projections called pillars. So bacteria can actually share DNA. So an, an opportunistic pathogen can become pathogenic by picking up some of these virulence factors for example. Okay so 
In a previous video and in this video, I've covered how do opportunistic uh, pathogens become pathogenic, and it boils down to these factors. Dose, how much bacteria are you getting? If you get a big load of an opportunistic bacteria, it can be invasive and become a pathogen. If you're only getting a small load, it might even be good to get that amount of that bacteria. Location, if you transport an opportunistic bacteria from somewhere where your body has evolved to protect you to somewhere where your body hasn't evolved to protect you, you, for example, if you get fecal matter in your lungs, you're going to get bacteria that are normally fine in your large intestine causing a lung infection. So location is important. A weakened immune system is important, things like HIV. Dysbiosis, that's a mismatch in your bacterial balance. And last and not least, what I covered in this video, and that's strain and virulence factors. So um, the, ge the genotype of the bacteria dictates what proteins it's got, including what virulence factors it's got, and how those virulence factors in interact with the body is how uh, an opportunistic pathogen can become pathogenic. Up next I'm going to be talking about how do we use AI to beat bacteria and to first address that I have to sort of go what is AI so I'm going to give a quick uh, introduction to AI in my next video.